Hi there, in this video I wanted to talk again about testing for serial correlation in our errors, but in this video we're going to talk about a specific test which is called the Durban Watson test. So just remembering what we did last time, the idea was that we had some sort of population error process whereby our error in period t was related to our error in period t minus 1 plus some sort of idiosyncratic error ut. And the way in which we went, to, went about testing this was by taking our residuals from our OLS regression and regressing them on a constant and our residuals in the period t minus 1. And the idea here is that if we were to test for significance of delta 1, then that was kind of our way of testing for whether rho is equal to naught in the population. So our null hypothesis here was that rho is equal to naught, in other words, that we have no serial correlation. And our alternative hypothesis here was that rho does not equal naught. Okay, so, and we did that by means of a t-test. So there is another way in which we can test for serial correlation, and for historic reasons, it's known as the Durbin-Watson statistic. And the Durbin-Watson statistic is defined as if I sum from t equals 2 to n of et hat, so my residuals in period t, minus my residuals in period t minus 1, all squared, and then if I take that and divide it through by my sum from t equals 1 to n of et hat, all squared. Okay, so it looks like quite a complicated statistic, but what essentially does it mean and what's the analogy with what we were doing before? Well, actually, it turns out that the least squared estimator for delta 1, which we get in doing this second regression, is in fact very, very much related to the Durbin-Watson statistic. One way in which it's different is that the bottom here would in fact be the sum of from t equals 2 to n of e t minus 1 all squared which isn't actually that different if I have a very large sample, right? Because whether I include that first error or I don't, it's not going to make that big a deal, but perhaps it makes more of a deal in smaller sample sizes. Okay, so if we do that, um, we can sort of think about there as being some sort of approximate relationship between our value of delta 1, which we would get from this sort of equation, this auxiliary equation, and the Durbin-Watson statistic. It turns out that the Durbin-Watson statistic is approximately equal to 2 times 1 minus delta 1, where delta 1 is our estimate of rho in our sample, right? So there is some sort of approximate relationship between the Durbin-Watson statistic and what we were doing before, but the analogy isn't absolutely perfect. The null hypothesis for the Durbin-Watson statistic is that rho is equal to zero against the alternative hypothesis, which is that rho is greater than zero. So immediately we see that there is some sort of difference in the alternative hypothesis between the two different types of test. That's one particular difference. Another one is even though the t-test has a particular region whereby we reject the null hypothesis and a region where we do not reject the null hypothesis, where it's sort of defined by if t, the, mod the modulus of t is equal to the critical value, that's a sort of boundary, right? And if it's greater than that, we reject. If it's lower than that, we don't reject. The difference with the Durbin-Watson statistic is that it doesn't exactly work that way. If we find that the Durbin-Watson statistic is greater than some sort of upper critical value, in that circumstance only do we not reject the null hypothesis. However, there is a region for which the Durbin-Watson statistic is inconclusive. If the Durbin-Watson statistic is greater than some lower bound, but less than the upper bound which we stated here, then in that circumstance the Durbin-Watson statistic is what we deem to be inconclusive. So there is a region whereby we don't know whether we should not reject the null or the fact that we should reject the null hypothesis. And then finally, as you might expect, if the Durbin-Watson statistic is less than some sort of lower critical value, only in that circumstance do we reject the null hypothesis. And as you might expect, this inconclusive region is a real problem with the Durbin-Watson statistic when you compare it to, let's say, the t-test. A further problem with the Durbin-Watson statistic is that it is not robust to the inclusion of endogenous regressors. So if you have a lag-dependent variable in your model, you shouldn't be using the Durbin-Watson statistic, whereas you can adapt the t-test, which I sort of indicated over here on the left, in order to take this into account.
So why do we care about the Devon Watson statistic? Well, one of the reasons is sort of mainly historical. Historically, it's always been one of the statistics which has been reported by default in statistical programs, along with, let's say, the R squared and T stats. But there is another much more important reason for us talking about the Dover Watson statistic. And it's that essentially the t-test up here relies on some sort of asymptotic theory. It relies on the central limit theorem. So essentially when we're conducting this test in finite samples, our tests, which are based on an asymptotic distribution, are only sort of approximately correct. By contrast, we can derive exact sampling distributions for the Durban Watson statistic. So even in finite samples, we can actually conduct inference um, without using any sort of approximations. So that's one of the benefits of the Durban Watson statistic over the t-test. Essentially, when you have a small sample size, it might be preferable to use the Durban Watson statistic over that of the t-test. In the next video, we're going to talk about how we can correct the t-test for higher order serial correlation and for the presence of endogenous regressors.